Well, good morning. Again, I am so happy to see how many people made it through this storm. For those watching on Facebook, we have a blizzard here, and I will say it was a blizzard. We lost power last night. We've got good three-foot drifts in a lot of areas around here, so it's pretty difficult getting to church for some folks. We're glad to see everybody was able to make it. So today, we're talking about It's Not Mine, Part 2. And I really believe there's a blessing for you today. This is something to listen to. Because we're going to talk about it's not my problem. Now, the Bible talks about how we take care of people. The Bible talks about how we're to help people. But the Bible also talks about sometimes it's not our problem. And one of the biggest issues that we have... So we like to take on problems that aren't ours to fix. Doesn't mean we don't pray for them, but we take on problems that aren't ours to fix. So point number one is, you can't fix everything. You can't fix everything. See, I've tried. I had a nail gun that I was halfway through thinking I could get it fixed when I finally just gave up and beat it with the sledgehammer and then threw it away. <laughs> I gave up. I needed an expert. I couldn't do it. So you can't fix everything. There's a lot of things I have fixed. But you can't always do everything. And I'm one of those guys, I, I don't, I have too much pride. I can't like walk into the repair shop with a sack with everything and all the bolts and be like, can you put this back together? I, I, I just, I'm not quite there. So there are things that we can fix, and there are things that we can't fix. And today, I want us to think about what we can't fix. And point number two, thou shall not steal. Thou shall not steal. I had to write that on my ruler, and my calculator, and pens and pencils in high school. It really helped people remember that I didn't like my stuff being taken. But we're not to be stealing a burden from somebody else. See, sometimes there are burdens for some people, and God has that in their life. They're not for us. And we're so tempted to steal them. I don't want to get political. I'm not even going to get political. But the recent Supreme Court justice was all over the news. And whether you like the confirmation or not, people on both sides of the fence were all up in arms and none of the people that I talked to that were so upset about it could do a thing about it. I'm like, why are you taking on this burden? This isn't our issue. It's not our, we can't do anything about it. We can't fix this, we can't change it. Why is this your issue? Pray. When you can't go any further, we need to know that the last step is on our knees. It's not to try and fix everything, it's on our knees. God, what do you have? And point number three is then you have to let go and be free. Let go and be free. So you only need to worry about what's in your basket. You ever watch little kids on the Easter egg hunt? They get so distracted by what somebody just got in their basket, they miss 50 eggs over here. And the moms and dads are going, no, no, look, look, it's over here. Look, look, at no, 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 you see? What? I wanted the blue one. What are you talking about the blue one? What do you care about the blue one? There's 60 other green ones. Just go get eggs. We do it all the time. We're so focused on what somebody else just put in their basket. We want it. It consumes us. Oh, they got a car. I need a car. Oh, they remodeled their house. I need to remodel my house. Oh, they finally fixed their sink. I need to fix my sink. Oh, they have this going on. Oh, they need it. I need to fix them. Because I'm so holy and righteous, my world is completely together, I'm going to go fix their problem. Now let's work on what's in our basket. Only what's in our basket. And the big part of that is the relationship and the dynamic with the Holy Spirit showing us what's in our basket. Ecclesiastes 3.6 says, there's a time to search and a time to give up. Kind of like the nail gun. A time to keep and a time to throw away. We have to remember that. 
There is a season. There is a purpose. What is God showing us? We're so busy in our own strength, ready to fix it, change it, and do it, that we miss out on the opportunity of the blessing, the little green eggs. So point number one, you can't fix everything. In John chapter 18, verses 10 through 13, Simon Peter. I love to talk about Peter because Peter, he was a rugged guy. He was tough. And Peter had great intentions. He was just trying to help. There was nothing in this scripture that says Jesus was going to chastise Peter. There was nothing in this scripture that said Jesus couldn't handle himself. We know that Jesus could. But Peter wanted to do something about the situation. How many of you have ever stood in a spot where you saw somebody in an imminent place and you felt it was your place to intervene? We all have those feelings. It's so, this is a difficult topic to, to bring up because people say, well, I acted. Well, I feel compelled to act. And sometimes you should. Absolutely you should feel compelled to act. Unless the Holy Spirit is telling you no. Unless God himself is saying, I don't want you to get involved in that. And the only way you're going to know that time is if your relationship is not obstructed. If our relationship with Christ is obstructed, we can't be in constant communion. We're not in communication. We can't hear that voice. Think about it with the cell phone. Don't you love it? Driving along, talking away, yakety yak a yak, and all of a sudden the other person's talking. And you're like, no, I'm talking. And they have no idea you're talking because the connection is gone. Happens all the time. We think nothing of it. That's a big deal with Christ. See, when we're missing the conversation with Him, we're missing. We're missing blessings. We're missing guidance. We're missing provision. We're missing peace. We're missing joy. And all of these things come together. We're missing it because we're so focused on what am I doing here? And we're not getting the connection. So it says in this, Verse 10, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's service, cutting off his right ear. They're coming to arrest Jesus. I don't know if I would have done much different in that situation. I understand Peter's standpoint. It wasn't like, Oh, Peter had no self-control. Oh, Peter, this open. No. Peter had the best of intentions. So many times we have the best of intentions, but they're just not God-led. They're just not ordained. And we shouldn't act on them. And the only way we're going to know is making sure that our relationship with Christ is good. That our connection is right. That our connection is strong. We need to be in the right place. So don't go thinking, well, Peter was off his rocker. Well, Peter... No, no. Peter just was missing it. And this is why Jesus then said, Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? We just took communion last week. Jesus talked to them. They had the Last Supper. And now he's saying, hey, Peter, do you remember that night? You remember what I'm talking about here? And then the detachment of soldiers with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. And they bound him and they brought him in for trial. See, that was the will of God. You didn't see Peter continue to rise up. When Jesus said, hey, wait a second. Peter, you're missing it. This is about a purpose. Peter pulled back. There was no further consequence. Isn't that a miracle? Didn't take Peter in. Jesus put the ear back on the guy, right? Healed him. 
I want you to understand that because with the minute that you miss it, there's opportunity to fix it. Okay? But you can't fix everything. God will fix it. And it starts with the mistake you made. And then he takes care of their situation. God took care of Jesus. That was a God-appointed time. Not one man on earth could have ever prevented the crucifixion. It was ordained by God. It was established by God for us. Not a doubt in my mind. So when we think about somebody else's problem, and before we want to leap, and I'm the guy that loves to leap, I don't like all the details sometimes. I'd rather like just start getting it done. And I think that's what Peter does, and I think we all are tempted to do that sometimes. But we need to make sure our connection's right. Talk to God. Run it past Him. Think about it. Do we ever fly things past God before we move on it? Lord, so and so is having this issue. I, I feel led to go talk to him and do X, Y, and Z. And you feel this well in inside you, don't go. But pray. You can't fix it. And then you need to pray. But the other thing of that is, is when you absolutely have no control over something, no control, you can't do a thing about it. Don't get involved. We're taking away our joy and our peace every day by taking on burdens that just aren't ours. Can't fix the traffic on I-25, not one of you. They can't do it. And we can sit and fret and stew about it, talk about it all day long. We can do all... There's nothing we can do about it. You can't fix it. So if you let that get you so wrapped up every day, you're forefooting your joy. And that's voluntarily. No one's taking it from you. You're giving it up. Don't do that. You can't fix everything. And you'll know what you can fix. Point number two. Thou shall not steal. Did you know how many times thou shall not steal is in the Bible? It's a couple of times in the Old Testament, then it's reiterated again in the Old Testament. Then it's reiterated by Jesus in the New Testament in a couple of books. Then it's reiterated again in Romans. Why is it so important? We should not steal. And we shouldn't steal somebody else's burden either. The whole concept behind stealing is taking something that doesn't belong to you. We all look at it and go, well, I mean, don't take so-and-so's car. That's totally stealing. But then somebody has some major issue going on, and we all of a sudden think that we need to take on that battle. I'm not here to judge one married couple in this room. How many couples have ever gotten into an argument about somebody else's problem in their life, and you have a difference of opinion on it. What, why are you wasting your time on that? What are you doing? That's not even your battle. Don't steal it. That's their battle. Why are you taking somebody else's baggage, bringing it into your marriage, into your relationship, to fight over it, and there's nothing you're gonna do about it anyway. You just wanna have the same position. What are you doing? Why do we do that? See, that's stealing somebody else's problem, not ours. It's not ours to take. We shouldn't steal. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm going to say that one more time because we, we really need to hear this. Come to me, God, Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a promise. It's not something like sometimes. It's not like, well, maybe. No. I will give you rest. And you know how we get rid of that rest? By not coming to Him. All of a sudden, we decide to fix it on our own. 
and we start, well, I'm all upset about this and we can't get anything. Wait a second. That wasn't your baggage. You stole it. And now you're not even going to give it to God because you're going to try and fix it yourself. Well, I wonder why you don't have any rest in that situation. It's very difficult. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So people go, does that mean he's saying take my burden upon you? No, he's saying harness yourself to me and utilize my strength and watch what I can do. You ever seen somebody, my grandpa, when we would break horses, his big saying was, you always have to get a good horse. And you tie that new horse to the good horse. And they can't go anywhere. And then you start deciding to do what you need to do. And that horse learns very quickly from the other horse what to do. It's pretty effective. We did it many times. Because that other horse's power can definitely dictate the situation. And you can count on that. And Jesus is saying, take my yoke. Harness yourself to me. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So many times we take this on and we just, we, we, we just take it and we battle it and we battle it. Oh, I want to, oh, I need to do this and I need to take, wait, wait a second. Pause. Am I connected to Jesus? Because he's the powerhouse. Anybody knows, you, you try and pull a wagon with one horse. It can do it. Add a second horse, it can do it better. It's just the way it is. Jesus is saying, hey, you can pull the wagon on your own. You can do it. Kind of. But it's even better if I do it with you. I see these moms and dads that get this new bicycle. It's a, a half a bicycle that hooks onto the back of mom and dads so the kid can feel like they're pedaling. And once in a while they're doing some support pedaling. But for the most part, mom and dad are pulling them on the trailer and they're going through the most. That, that's what we, but think about that with Jesus. You can ride your own little bike for miles and exhaust yourself. You just hitch on to him. We're so busy taking other burdens, trying to fix them. We don't have the strength to do it. We're stealing it. It's robbing us of our happiness. It robs us of our joy. And then we sit there and say, God, would you fix this? I am going to only say it because I've done it so many times. I'm pretty good at it. I'm pretty good at trying to take on somebody else's issue. And, and the Lord has been showing me and walking me through saying, wait a second. That's not your burden to take. Strap yourself to me. Let's work through your stuff. Don't steal other people's issues. It doesn't mean that we're not praying for people. It doesn't mean that when somebody's asking for advice that you don't give it. I think the connotation that we, we want to think about is Jesus talked about parables so many times because he didn't want to say, if, he, if Jesus would have said, here are the Ten Commandments, which he didn't say, then that would be plastered everywhere. People are like, these are the Ten Commandments, Jesus said, and that's what you have to do. And what he wants us to understand is the essence of the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. And that was a whole new concept in Christianity at the time. Is having the Spirit guide us and having the Spirit lead us. But if we take and have an issue where we're see somebody and we're like, well, the only reason they have all these money problems is they don't know how to save their money. They leave their lights on all the time, blah, blah, blah. That's stealing somebody's burden. A different way that we might look at that is ask them, hey, do you guys need any help? And if they say no, then we go to our knees. No further steps. But typically when they say no, that's when we want to go, well, I know she'll leave your lights on. Can you imagine how much money you'd save if you shut those off? 
We, we take these little steps. We take the liberty to try and fix them. And that's the spot that we're stealing. So hope you see what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean we're not offering to help. It doesn't mean that we're not there. It means that when we get to a point that you can't get any further, you need to let it go to God. Another saying my grandfather used to say is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You do the best you can, but at some point, there's nothing else you can do. So don't steal it. Point number three, let go and be free. Letting go and being free is the biggest challenge. It is so easy to say, let go and let God. Until you're living it. Until you're in the midst of something in your life. I don't know how this is going to work out. And no matter how good you are, a part of you wants to start thinking about it. I wonder. And then that wonder begins to keep you up at night. And then that wonder begins to consume you. And now you're looking at the green egg instead of all these other ones over here. And we're missing that opportunity. It really wrecks your joy. It wrecks your happiness. It wrecks what God is trying to give to you. He wants you to have a full and abundant life. It says in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and I know this is a lot. This is something you write down and you hang on your refrigerator, or maybe like in the medicine cabinet, and you open the door and you read this once in a while because it's very, very important. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? I talk about that little temptation when you start to think about stuff. That's the battle within you. When we start, and that battle causes us trouble. Sure enough, you start stressing and dwelling on something that you can't even fix, and your mood changes. You ever walk into the room and somebody just watched something on the news and, and all you did was like tripped over the dog bone and they're like, watch out! And you're like, whoa, what are you, whoa, 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 what just happened? They, they're not mad at you per se. They just, just had a battle inside them that they were taking on. They're frustrated and you're the first opportunity to be vented at. But do we do that? Are we doing that to other people? Those battles within us can totally change the mood. Talk about the battles within people. I just went to get my driver's license. As you guys know, I'm, I'm old now. I'm over the hill now. And so I went to get my driver's I haven't got my driver's license in 15 years. Okay? Well, I, now, I take it back. I've, I've had a license. You get to renew it online until all of a sudden... They look at me and they went, he's too old. They put some rubber stamp on it and said, that guy's coming in person. We're getting a picture of him with wrinkles now. And that, we want to see how much hair he's lost too. That's what they do. So I got to show up in person to tell him I'm still here. I'm just getting older. And give him 30 bucks. And you would think when you go to get your driver's license, there's going to be a level of joy. Want to talk about the battles within people? Want to talk about the battles in society? I thought that I went into the morgue. These people were some of the most miserable people I've ever seen in my life. I walked out. I tried to crack a joke. The manager's waiting on me. I'm like, hey, do you have like a little squeaky rabbit or something you're going to do when you take my picture? I thought it was a cute joke. He couldn't even crack a smile. He was like, well, no. I mean, maybe people make these jokes more often, I don't know, but it was like, wow. And then, you know, they herd you around like cattle, they call you by number, you go here, you go there, I stand up, I sit down, I move over here. Next thing you know, it's time for my picture to be taken. I'm like, oh, that's great. Get my picture taken. So I stand up, I'm trying to be friendly to the lady, just trying to talk. She's snapping the picture. Look straight at the camera, second try. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, well, I can't, I, I'm sorry, sorry. You know, so I'm standing, I stand stiff. I get my picture taken, you know. All is good. I make two steps to the right without wiggling so nobody's mad. And I realize that the battles within people are huge. 
It's not like I'm just talking about people being, oh, you're miserable. No, society needs Jesus. Society is so broken, so tore down. Talk about the battles. They need Jesus and they don't even know it. And I watch the world around us filling with anger, feeling with all sorts of resentment. And what can I do? Can I fix anybody in there? Well, I giggled with them and I told them that my daughter Lily was getting her license next. And they didn't find that funny either. And we walked out of there laughing our little guts out all the way to Walmart. We had a great time. But it gave us joy. We're like, if they don't want to be happy, they don't have to be happy. We're going to be happy. And I urge every one of you, don't let other people's battles, don't let the battles inside you, don't let the circumstances around you begin to give you a battle. It takes away your joy. Be happy. Let it go. It goes on to say, you desire but do not have, so you kill. We may not physically go murder somebody, but when we want something and it consumes us, what damage do we do in pursuit of that? It says, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You know how many houses I've been to where some couple is fighting over money? You don't have what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You mean to tell me it's been going on for like 2,000 years? <laughs> People don't have what they want, and so they fight. Is it worth it? Is that our battle? Is that where we need to go? Oh, wow. I mean, let go. Just let go of it. Let go and be free. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That doesn't mean you don't have friends. It doesn't mean you don't function in society. It's not what they're talking about. It's talking about submitting to that way of the world. That, okay, I'll always be grouchy. Well, everybody wants us to be grouchy. No. People are saying you can't be friendly in the store. What was the big movement? You couldn't say Merry Christmas anymore. It wasn't politically correct. Until finally... What did enough people say? No, it's Christmas. Say Merry Christmas. Get over it. That's what we need to be able to do. We need to be free. And not worry about, well, what are people going to think? What are people going to say? That's not your burden. You just need to be free. Free in the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If he's taking care of me, be free. Be happy. Move on with life. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture said God opposed... <laughs> I'll try it again. That is why scripture said God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. See, if you want to let go... The letting go is letting go of the baggage and grabbing onto God. Submitting to Him. Harnessing yourself to Him. And then it's easier to resist the devil. And when you resist the devil, he flees. He does not have the power to overtake you. You know, there's this guy that people used to listen to on the radio, this Roy Mercer. People would pay him on the radio or... I don't know, do something. And he would call people and he would prank them. And he would always say he's going to, you know, he'd always say, well, just how big an old boy are you anyhow? And then people would say, well, you know, I'm about six foot six, 500 pounds. And, you know, he'd go, well, that's going to be quite a tussle, isn't it? <laughs> he was always telling people, I'm, I'm going to wrestle with you. But, but no one knows whether or not you could win. The same concept with the devil. It's a tussle. It's always going to be quite a tussle. He's always going to be hundreds of more pounds than you anticipate when you're not tethered to Christ. Because being tethered to Christ takes you to a new place. 
It takes you to a new level of strength. That's why he says, cast your burdens on him. That's why he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he's trying to talk about. You can't do this on your own. First, we want to steal everybody else's problems. We don't want to take care of our own problems, and then we want to fix them on our own. I mean, that's almost like a TV commercial. We could fix some of this. We really can. And the way that we fix it is by first tethering ourselves to Christ, not taking on everybody else's burdens, and then using Christ's strength to deal with our own. Imagine that as a concept. If we sit, and I challenge you to take your hands out, not right now, but take your hands out and start counting all the things that are really bothering you. Write them down. And then I want you to write what you can fix on each one of those. And the ones that you can't fix, I want you to scratch out and write pray beside them. That's it. And the ones that you can fix, I want you to go before the Lord and say, Lord, how do I, how do I proceed? Are you going to show me? Are you going to work this way? Where do we go here? Because I want victory. I want a change, but what I don't want is to be miserable. What I don't want is to fail. What I don't want is to lose. God didn't make us to be losers. He said we are more than conquerors. We're overcomers. We're meant to be victorious. Why does he take that much effort to put into our lives, I'll tell you why. Because we're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be joyful. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That should be a daily, daily, daily thought process. And we need to get up and we need to go forward with that and rejoice in our days. And when we're taking on all these other burdens and all these other battles and frustrations and everything else, we're missing out on the opportunities to have happiness. It's so, so, not your problem. So point number one, you can't fix everything. It says in Proverbs 17, 22, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. We need to be happy. It's good medicine. It's good for us. And if we're tethered to Christ, we're going to find we have more opportunities for joy than ever before. And the things that bother us aren't going to bother us as bad because we have the strength and the power to overcome it. And point number two, thou shalt not steal, it says in Deuteronomy 5.19. Thou shalt not steal. Quit taking other people's burdens. It's not yours. It's not yours. If you can't fix it, you pray for it and leave it at that. It's not welcome in your house. It's not welcome in your car. It's not welcome in conversation. Because all that does is depletes what God is trying to accomplish in you. And point number three is let go and be free. Let go of everything else and listen to God's guiding voice. I challenge you to read Isaiah 30, verse 21. It says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That is Christ walking behind you and guiding you. And so many times we're so busy trying to just do it. But it really said, your ears will hear. You need to have your ears ready to hear for the way. Because you're a problem solver. You're not entitled to take what isn't yours. Listen to the voice of God. With your own matters, not other people's matters, with your own matters, we listen to the voice of God and we'll be free, we'll be victorious, we'll be happy, we'll be blessed, and we'll just be alive. Will you please stand with me? We as the Car Community Church will always present Christ's open doors of heaven to everybody. If you'd like to make Jesus your Savior, you simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin, come into my heart. And I will serve you with all of my ability. If you prayed this prayer, we believe you have begun the Christian transformation. If you want to know more, it's simply like prayer. Feel free to come up during the last song. Father God, we come to you. Jesus, we thank you for being willing to walk beside us through every burden.
through every crisis, through every problem. Lord, help us to remember that you're there with us. You're walking beside us, behind us, and all around us. Help us to listen to your voice so we find direction, Lord. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. I ask for special blessing over everybody's week. May your favor rest on everybody. Your purpose be continued and revealed in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're singing. I don't know what we're singing. Oh, it's going to do it. I don't know. 328. I don't like my voice being on that. I'm singing. <laughs> Right, everybody should be hungry. Stay for potluck. There's food. And we'll see you next week with part three. And it's going to be even different again.